it is not that long that we realize that we are surrounded by a world invisible to our eyes, consisting of very tiny organisms which yet have a tremendous influence on animal health, ecology and evolution. On Earth, we are surrounded by fascinating biodiversity, and this biodiversity clearly must have been evolved at some point. And taking a look onto this and putting the Earth life history onto a simplified time scale, like over a calendar year, we will realize that early life just appeared around March on Earth and was consisted of single-celled organisms until September. The first multicellular organisms just appeared in October. Land, land plants and insects evolved in November and higher animals in December. And when we put the evolution of the humans onto the scale, we will realize that we just appeared very, very recently in Earth life history, like basically in the end of December. So life on Earth was dominated by and consisted of simple single-celled organisms for most of the time. We all evolved in a microbial world. And the word microorganism already implies that these organisms are too tiny to be seen by naked eye. And therefore, humans had no idea about their existence for a very long time. Even fatal disease, hunger crisis, and epidemics, which are actually caused by microbial pathogens, could never be brought into context, and there was no explanation for that. And so the first insights into microbiology was achieved in 1675 by Antoni van Leeuwenhoek. So Antoni wasn't a scientist, he was a lens grinder, but his abilities were that great that he could grind a lens of the size of a rice grain, which was extremely effective, and he built these first small microscopes, and he decided to take a look into a droplet of pond water. And what he saw was basically mind-blowing for him. He got insights into a new hidden world full of mysterious creatures that no human being has ever seen before, and he called them very little animaculas, and he drew them. But actually, his work wasn't fully acknowledged for almost 200 years. And most work about pulling the microbial world into light was achieved between the 1860s and 70s. And two of the most important works were done by Louis Pasteur, who could show that wine fermentation is actually not caused by a chemical process, which was believed to that time point, but rather by metabolic processes of living microorganisms. Because if you boil everything, you kill the life, and there is no activity anymore. And this is a sterilization method, which is still used in food industries, and which is called pasteurization. And Robert Koch who was the first person who could show that a bacterium was the cause of a disease, of anthrax. And afterwards, the germ theory of disease was generally acknowledged, which was followed by a boom in microbiological research and discovering several pathogens being the cause of many horrible diseases. But there were also findings about making beneficial use of some microbes in terms of fighting such pathogens. In 1929, Alexander Fleming discovered that there was a mold contamination on one of his agar plates. He actually studied pathogenic bacteria. And normally that's not a big problem, you would just discard this plate. But he realized that around this mold colony, the bacterial growth was inhibited, so the mold was secreting something that killed the bacterium. And this is the very first antibiotic, penicillin, which saved thousands and thousands of lives. And clearly, the mold is not producing this for human sake. It is doing this because in a natural microbial community, it will be surrounded by diverse other microbial species. And they all fight. They fight for resources, for space and food. And indeed, there are several microbes that are able to produce a bunch of nasty compounds, like antibiotics, toxins, or ethanol, to kill competing microbial species. So people started to realize the importance, but also the potential, to start to study microorganisms. And indeed, we can culture several of them, and we can make them visible and accessible for us. But indeed, only the minority of microorganisms on Earth is really cultivable. And it's a bit hard to talk about numbers, because researchers are still arguing how many microbial species we really, we really have on Earth but potentially it's about 1% that we know. So if you want to study microorganisms from a natural environment, 
you culture them, and then you can classify them, you can run experiments, and you can sequence them to get their genomic information. But this information is just the tip of the iceberg. And we have no idea what is below and which diversity we are missing just because we cannot culture this stuff. And luckily, science is progressing. And nowadays, we have different methods which will not rely on this culturing step anymore. And depending on what you're interested in, you can extract total DNA, RNA, or proteins. You can analyze the data, and you can check the diversity, the relative abundance, or you do functional profiling of the whole microbial community. And this is when researchers started to, to basically sequence everything around them. And also when we realized how huge the biodiversity in the microbial world really is. And look outside of the window, go into a forest, or dive, deep, dive deeply down to an awesome coral reef. It is very likely that you will never face such a biodiversity that you can find in microbial communities. And it was also the time point when we realized microbes are not only everywhere around us, they also colonize us inside and outside. So we have at least as many bacterial cells colonizing us as we have actual human body cells. That are 30 to 40 trillion, that are 12 zeros. So this is a really huge number, and it somehow must affect us somehow, doesn't it? And nowadays we agree that all higher organisms are closely associated with a diverse microbial community. And this gave rise to the term holobiont, defining the host organism together with these associated microbes, the microbiota, as a unit natural selection acts on. In the beginning of host microbiota research, again, many people focused on studying the bad guys. And clearly there are some pathogenic microbes that can make us sick. But that's not everything, and it more and more turned out that there are diverse microorganisms having different beneficial functions for the host. And so your microbiota will act as a first barrier, protecting your body from getting colonized by pathogens. They can actively fight pathogens by, for example, producing antimicrobial compounds. They can improve host nutrition by helping the host to digest food or by supplying beneficial substances. They can detoxify harmful substances in the diet, and they are also known to be involved in modulating host development, immune system, and even behavior. So microorganisms are taking huge tasks, and so it's not that surprising that they can actually act as drivers of animal evolution. And to give some examples, the microorganisms in the intestines of herbivores are responsible that the host can get enough nutrients from the cellulose-rich plant diet. Like the koala has a two-meter-long cecum, which is densely colonized by microbes, which help to digest the eucalyptus leaves. Bioluminescent bacteria are helping to modulate the light organs of some squids. They will also colonize this, emitting a constant light. And the squid will provide nutrients to these bacteria and is also able to manipulate the light intensity based on the actual moon and starlight, which will erase its shadow in the water, making it invisible for bottom-dwelling predators. And I think many of us like coffee, but... So the plant is not producing caffeine to give us a better start until the morning. It's doing that to protect itself from getting eaten. And indeed, high doses of caffeine is deadly for most insects. Like They just get immediately paralyzed and die. And really almost all of them. One exception is this little beetle. This is the coffee borer. And it will develop in the coffee berry. It's basically bathed in caffeine. But it's not the beetle itself that evolved the resistance against the substance. When you remove the internal bacteria then the beetle will react like all the other insects. It will die when it consumes caffeine. So the internal bacteria are responsible for detoxifying the caffeine for the beetle, opening a new niche and environment for it. So there are many more awesome examples around. But we might see that microbes actually have a huge influence on animal ecology and evolution. 
So it might be surprising that host microbiota research is still hampered. And one simple reason is the number of species involved in most systems. Like in the human gut, we have at least 160 main bacterial species. And we are talking about a microbial community. All of these species can have an effect on the host, but they will also interact with each other. And the outcome of these interactions, again, can have a complete different effect. To make the whole system more complicated, we know that, host, that the host genotype can influence the microbial community composition. And on top of that, we have environmental factors, like, for example, coming from the host diet. To put it in simple words, most host microbiota systems are simply too complex and not experimentally tractable. And this is what we need to understand the fundamentals. It is basically like studying a tornado while you are standing in the middle of it. So this is the reason why we, are, why we really need simple systems that we can fully understand to be able to apply this knowledge to the more complex systems. This is the time point where we would like to introduce the honeybee being a really good model for host microbiota questions. Honeybees are naturally associated with a small, stable and long co-evolved microbiota consisting of about nine core bacteria species, which are all cultivable. The microbiota gets horizontally transmitted from older to younger bees, which is actually similar compared to how uh, the human microbiota gets transmitted. And the whole system is experimentally tractable. But there's also another reason why it's really important to better understand the system. And that's bees are having a very important job on Earth. They are our main pollinating species. And at least one third of our daily diet depends on pollination. So without natural pollinators, we get significantly restricted. And these people are not having fun climbing around in the trees. They are doing the job of bees. They actually pollinate flowers by hand because it is already reality in the world that we have areas without natural pollinators around. The reason for this worldwide decline is a combination of different stress factors, like poor nutrition due to agricultural monocultures or the toxins that we apply to our natural environment. But Honeybees are also naturally challenged with the diversity of pathogenic bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites, making their lives pretty miserable. And all of these stress factors could be already shown to negatively influence honeybee health. A healthy intact microbiota, on the other hand, is positive for the bee, potentially being able to buffer some of the negative effects coming from the stress factors. But interestingly, it just turned out recently that these stress factors will also negatively influence the microbiota, leading to, for example, a dysbiosis. And this can be the beginning of a vicious cycle for the bee, leading to sick and dying populations. So an intact microbiota is crucial for honeybee health, and we need to better understand all factors and the interconnections. One smart thing to do is, in general, to take a look into nature. And when we do that, we will realize that not all honeybee species or subspecies are suffering equally from the same stresses. The African bee has been introduced to Brazil in 1956 and has colonized almost all of the Western Hemisphere, which is one of the most rapid biological invasions known. It has met the wild European bees, and they made it, and they formed hybrids, the Africanized bees. Ah, there we go. And these hybrids are actually the ones that spread so rapidly. So indicating that they have a high fitness under the same natural circumstances. We know that the genotype can influence the microbiota composition. If we now consider that the microbiota has an impact on host fitness, this can lead to a difference in fitness in different changing, challenging, or new environments. We have three factors here. We have host genotype, we have microbiota, we have environment. And we can sequence that. We can check for microbiota differences between the genotypes. But this will not give us any answer about functional relationships. So what we need are controlled experiments. First thing, we need to get rid of the environmental factors because this is far too much to control for. So we can do something like reciprocal microbiota transfer experiments in the lab. We can challenge the bees against stress factors, and now we can disentangle if host genotype or the microbiota is more important in terms of stress resistance. 
We can break the system down. We can feed single bacteria cells to test their effect. We can feed two bacteria, or we go step by step more complex, three, four, five, to test which effects the interactions between the bacteria will have on the host. And to put everything together, honeybee colonies are worldwide in danger, and the reason are different stress factors, like poor nutrition and toxins. And this can negatively influence the microbiota, leading to example for low, to a lowering of the diversity. But that's not everything, there's more stress around. So we have pathogens, we have parasites, again with a negative influence on the bee. And what a beekeeper will do now to save the colony, he, will, he or she <laughs> will provide antibiotics or apply toxins to the hive environment. Um, but again, this could be shown to negatively influence the microbiota. And of course, right, the whole system so there's, there are many more factors involved than just genotype and microbiota and stress. And it also doesn't matter which stress factors comes first and in which combination, but at some point it might be too much stress. And so one solution could be, instead of going for this short-term solution by providing antibiotics and toxins, would be to maintain a healthy and diverse microbiota, which is co-evolved with the host and to allow it to fight for its host. And we can do something like this by providing beneficial microorganisms, for example. But before we can do something like this in an efficient way, we must understand everything. And so we still need to do some more research. Thank you very much. <laughs>